experience it. Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this Thanksgiving edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. You know I love Thanksgiving. It's a time when we as a family get together and we give thanks for all of God's blessings that we've enjoyed for the year. Thanksgiving about our family, Thanksgiving about our home, Thanksgiving for God's provisions. But I think it's especially important for us to realize this time that uh, there's nothing that pleases God more than when we claim the promise in the midst of troubles that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And to realize the greatest expression of our faith is to praise God when we're in the midst of some hard times and trials, like when we are out of a job or one of our loved ones has just been taken to the hospital or when we lose someone we love very much. And so I want you to realize awesome power is released when we praise God genuinely for his grace and for the way he keeps his promises, even in the midst of humanly impossible situations, even when we can't understand why God has allowed what we're in, we just put it in God's hands and praise him genuinely anyway. There are very few things that we can give to God, but the scripture shows us that the greatest thing we can give to God is praise from the heart about his person, his faithfulness, and his love and his grace toward us. In 2009, I did a special program about these concepts. Folks, we're approaching what I think is one of the most important traditional uh, celebrations nationwide all year, and that's the Thanksgiving celebration. You know, this was started by pilgrims who had come here to escape the tyranny of overpowering governments and the freedom to worship God as they pleased. And uh, that finally got cast uh, into a permanent holiday. But never have we been at a time when we needed to understand the power of thanksgiving to God based on being aware of real desperate dangers facing this nation. You know, there's a passage in Second Chronicles chapter 20 uh, that really parallels the situation that we are in right now in the United States. Many don't realize it, but let me tell you, this country's in desperate danger right now. So I want you to think with me about what God did in another situation when Israel had been lackadaisically ignoring the Lord and not really paying attention to the things that God had done for them. We are come to a time in the first part of chapter 20 of 1 Chronicles when the king Jehoshaphat of Judea uh, was told that there was a mighty army that was gathering on their border. These were people that were from the uh, from the people of Moab, Ammon, the Ammonites, and evil, even from people joined with them from Syria, or ancient Assyria, and uh, several others that had all confederated against them to come and destroy their kingdom. Now, this was no small danger. They, it was reported they were already at En Gedi. Now, En Gedi is right on the border down by the Jordan River Dead Sea area. So they were already in uh, a desperate situation. But what Jehoshaphat did is what we Christians need to do. I wish we had a leader that would do what Jehoshaphat as a leader did. 
But we can, as God's people, turn just as he did with all of his people. Now listen, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, now listen to this, because what he prays is based on promises that were given by King Solomon when he built the temple originally. He said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? He here is asking the question that's based on promises that are made in the Bible. So he's laying the groundwork to crack the faith barrier right here by uh, turning his eyes away from an impossible situation and saying, you've promised and there's nothing too great for you to handle. And so it was at this point that uh, he went on and he says, Oh, our God, will you not judge these powers that have unrighteously come against us? And he brings out the fact that they had spared them when they originally took the land. He said, for we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now, here is a perfect example of through knowing and believing the promises of God, you go into the divine viewpoint of life. The divine viewpoint of life is to look at the circumstances, but then to see the Lord as greater than any circumstances and to put the Lord to the test by claiming a promise and saying, Lord, we don't know what to do. We put this in your hands and our faith is in you and you will act. So he claims that and uh, it says, Now all Judah, with their little ones, their wives, and their children, stood before the Lord. Now when a declaration of faith is made like that by God's people, God's going to act. And he did. In verse 14, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, etc., who was a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. In other words, this, this man was turned into a prophet. The Lord came upon him. And the Lord said through him, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Folks, we're in a situation every bit as desperate as Judah was then. This should be our daily prayer. For the battle is not yours, but God's. He said, tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Now, this whole congregation, led by Jehoshaphat, took very literally what God promised and they believed it. In this impossible situation, from the human viewpoint, they had no chance. But he said, you don't need to fight in this battle, for the battle is the Lord's. And so, it says that uh, uh, they were exhorted by Jehoshaphat. He said, hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. 
believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe in his prophets. That's like today we believe in his word. The prophets were the word of God. And you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who would sing to the Lord, who should praise the beauty of his holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now, I want you to notice in verse 22, this is how the Lord responds to people who crack the faith barrier and prove that faith by praising the Lord based on standing on his promises. It says, and when, that's the big word, underline it five times, and when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. Listen, folks. We can claim those same kinds of promises today. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, capsulizes this principle. If my people, who are called by my name, would humble themselves and confess their sins and cry out to me, then I will hear from heaven and will heal their land and deliver them. And this Thanksgiving... Let's praise the Lord because we know the battle is the Lord's. Today. In this next segment, I want to review what I said in 2011 about the wonders of what praise from God's children when they're in deep trouble and impossible situation really does. God loves it when his children just in darkness praise him because of who he is and his promises and how we know that he never allows anything into our life that isn't meant to bless us the power of praise. The Lord considers giving thanks to Him in all our circumstances the greatest expression of our faith. And conversely, the Lord considers griping about our circumstances as the greatest expression of unbelief. The Bible says, in everything give thanks. For this, whatever's happening, is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The only way we can give thanks in all things is to know and believe God's standard operating procedure promise, Romans 8, 28. It says, for we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You see, all things are not good, but God promises to work them together for our ultimate good. This verse promises that whatever happens to us, God can and will work together for our ultimate blessing. We just need to praise Him and believe He will take care of us according to His will. There's tremendous power in praise to the Lord, especially in what appears to be an impossible situation. Let me illustrate from one of the Apostle Paul's experiences. In Acts chapter 16, the Apostle Paul was seeking guidance from the Lord as to where he should go next to minister. He sought to evangelize in several places. He sought to launch into Asia in various places, but the Holy Spirit forbade him to go into any of them. He finally received a vision in which a man said to him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. He was assured that this was God's will, and so he set out by ship to that area and came to a leading city of Macedonia named Philippi. After several weeks of seeking to evangelize, Paul had only led a traveling saleswoman and her family to the Lord. Plus, 
a demon-possessed slave girl who was a fortune teller through that spirit. Because he cast the demon of fortune telling out of the girl, she could no longer bring her master's money, and they became very angry. So they stirred up the crowds with false accusations against Paul and Silas, his companion. This caused a riot, and as a result, the chief rulers of the city ordered their clothes torn off and then had them severely beaten with rods. With their backs laid raw and bleeding, Paul and Silas were thrown into the lower dungeon and chained by their ankles in stocks. Prisons of that day were usually wet and filthy with rats. They were terrible. So there they were, unjustly accused, imprisoned, and their backs laid raw with deep, painful cuts. And they were chained in an uncomfortable position in which they could not even lay down. So, suppose this were you. How would you respond to this? Paul could have responded the way most Christians would, with self-pity and griping. He could have said, Well, Lord, I came here in your will. I only sought to lead people to Christ. And now look at this horrible condition I'm in. Yeah, it really pays to serve you, Lord. <laughs> but instead... Paul and Silas took the divine viewpoint. They knew that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him. They began to exert the awesome power of praise to God. We read, But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. You know, when the Lord sees his child in an impossible, unexplainable situation, and yet by faith praises him, he will shake the very earth to deliver them. The very jailer who was responsible for keeping them in the dungeon ended up believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and brought all of his family to believe that night. He himself took Paul and Silas and tended to their wounds. Many of the prisoners also came to faith in Christ. And when the chief magistrate found that Paul was a Roman citizen, <laughs> they begged him to forgive them and leave. So, look at this. The charter members of the Philippian church were a traveling saleswoman, a former demon-possessed fortune teller, and the head of a jail. And all of their families, of course, were also brought to Christ with them. The church at Philippi became one of the greatest churches of the New Testament era. It was a product of praise to God in impossible things. Thanksgiving is also, by the way, the way to inner peace. God promises, stop worrying about anything. I know it says, be anxious for nothing, but in the original Greek, it says to stop something that's going on, and it's about worry. So he says, stop worrying about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, now note this, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, and I might add all misunderstanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul expresses the ultimate attitude of living by faith when he said this while he was in a Roman jail in Rome. He said, I am not saying this because I'm in need. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who literally keeps strengthening me. Now, do you know to whom he wrote that? The Philippian church. <laughs> the very ones 
where they had seen the power of praise that he exercised in their midst. But you know, another thing that I want us to learn this Thanksgiving about faith and the most, you know, the importance of giving thanks is to avoid at all costs the curse of a short memory. You know, the Lord holds up the generation of Israelites who were uh, the ones that Moses led out in the Exodus. And uh, the big thing that keeps occurring, God would work an enormous miracle to deliver them from impossible odds. And you would think that they would learn after three or four of those cases, when they failed at every time, uh, when they were in these impossible situations, to remember what God had just done, and then to say, he'll do the same thing now. But instead, they griped and griped and griped. And they griped against Moses. It became, when in doubt, gripe against Moses, as if Moses was in charge of everything. So uh, the, the principle is taught that one of the biggest problems all believers have is a short memory, a short memory of when they were in real impossible trouble, unexplained, and they turned to God and believed, or even just a little bit of faith, they turned to God and cried out to Him to deliver them, and He did. And we've all had those situations, and yet we fail to remember His deeds. The Bible repeatedly emphasizes that successfully walking with God by faith requires us to remember how the Lord delivered us from difficulties and trials in the past. Faith is built around remembering how God keeps His promises to us. The Exodus generation is God's great example of the importance of living by faith in God's promises. Their ultimate failure was to forget what God did to deliver them in many impossible situations one after another and not to apply the memory of those great deliverances to the next test of their faith. They had just been brought to the border of the promised land and when they sent spies in to spy it out, uh, 10 of the 12 spies gave a, a report that uh, it's exactly wonderful like the Lord said it would be, but there are giants there. And the majority report was one of unbelief. In spite of all the Lord had done to show that he would take care of the little detail of throwing the giants out of the land. But two of them, Joshua and Caleb, had cracked the faith barrier and learned to look at what the Lord had done and applied what they had seen. And so when these people were all falling apart and saying they're giants there, they're, uh, this is what Joshua and, the, and Caleb said, Numbers chapter 14. The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which he promised flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they, will be, they are bread for us, literally. We'll eat them alive. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said, stone them to death. Can you believe that? Then the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and this is what the Lord said. The Lord said to Moses, how long will this people spurn me? How long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? You see, what signs did he perform in their midst? Well, first of all, uh, the Lord did many miraculous signs in Egypt, and the Lord worked one miraculous judgment after another to break Pharaoh's will and make him let them go. And then the Lord, as he took them out, visibly appeared before them in a pillar of cloud to lead them by day and a column of fire to lead them by night. So they knew that God was with them visibly. Then they saw the Lord deliver them from the mightiest army in the world of that time, the Egyptian army, as they were trapped with their backs to the Red Sea. 
God used Moses to open the Red Sea, and they went through on dry land, and then a flood wiped them out. They saw the Lord miraculously give them water. There were three million people plus, plus a million and a half animals. He gave water in the desert for them. Then they saw the Lord purify a poison spring when they were out of water again. Then they saw the Lord provide perfect food for them every day. There are no supermarkets out there, and he had three million people to feed. So he rained on them a, a bread that he called the bread of heaven. And when the people found it lying all over the ground when he supplied it, uh, they came out wiping their eyes and over sleep, and they come out and they see these little wafers all over the ground and on the bushes. And the people said, Mana, which is Hebrew, for what is it? <laughs> and the Lord, with his sense of humor, said, Good, we'll call it what is it for 40 something years. Now, they saw God's faithfulness and his power to deliver them in each one of those incidents. And so they, they didn't get the lesson. They didn't remember. So the point is we must fear developing a continual pattern of unbelief and griping about our circumstances instead of realizing that God will work them together for our good. We just need to praise him and say, Lord, I can't wait to see how you're going to take care of this problem. This is what the Lord cherishes more than anything else. You know, of all the things that God gives us, there's only one thing we can give him back as a gift that he cherishes, and that's to praise him for his faithfulness for us. It's the supreme expression of our faith in the Lord's grace. So, on this Thanksgiving, begin to develop a habit of instead of panicking and griping about what's happening in your life today, to instead say, Lord, I don't know the answer to this. This is beyond me, but I know that you allowed it because you want to work it together for my good. So right now, I praise you, Lord, not because this isn't painful, but because I know that you We'll work it together for good, just as you always have. Well, that's it for tonight. I pray that you have a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend and that you spend the whole time remembering how gracious God is. And no matter what your circumstances, praise Him because we know that he causes all things to work together for good. Well, God willing, I'll see you next week. You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit HalLindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.